Okay. Good morning and welcome to the public to the committee's 27th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity uh, Committee. Could I please ask, make, ask everyone to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, no apologies have been received, but John Finney is away from the meeting attending a separate committee meeting and may return. We are moving now to agenda item five, which is an agriculture update. I would like to invite members to declare any relevant interests, and I would like to start off by declaring that I am a partner in a farming partnership, the details of which are disclosed on my register of interest. Peter. I will make a similar declaration in that I am a partner in a farming business as well. Stuart. Uh, I'm the part owner of a very small registered agricultural holding. Okay. This session forms part of our regular evidence taking, uh, evidence taking on agricultural matters, uh, part of this committee's area of scrutiny. Well, I'd like to welcome the, from the Scottish Government, Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for R the Rural Economy. Uh, I'd like to welcome Eleanor Mitchell, the Director of Agriculture and Rural Economy. David Barnes, the National Advisor on Agricultural Policy. Ian Davidson, the Head of Agricultural Policy Division. And Douglas Petrie, the Head of Area Offices and Head of Agricultural Profession. Cabinet Secretary, um, I'd like to invite you to give a short opening statement. And I'd like to say before we go into the questions that this is going to be a tight session. There are a lot of questions and I would encourage everyone to keep their comments as short as possible so I could make sure that everyone gets a chance to answer the questions that they want to and for the Cabinet Secretary to give answers to those. So Cabinet Secretary, you have three minutes. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning to everybody. I welcome the opportunity to discuss a wide range of topics today. I'll focus my initial remarks on just two issues, delivery progress and Brexit, and I hope to cover in Q&A the recent instance of BSE. Um, I have kept the committee fully appraised of progress with cap payments through our regular monthly updates, convener. I am pleased that we have achieved our target of making 95 per cent of Pillar 1 payments by the end of June. We have now completed 99.6 per cent of basic payment and greening payments, 99 per cent of Scottish Suckler Beef Support Scheme payments and 96.4 per cent of Scottish Upland Sheep Support Scheme payments. We started Pillar 2 payments, which of course don't have a regulatory deadline, in May and June this year, three months ahead of last year. We have now paid over 90 per cent of all Pillar 2 claims, completed almost 95 per cent of payments for LFAS, 89 per cent for beef efficiency and 97 per cent for our land manager option scheme. We are working hard to pay the vast majority of all outstanding Pillar 2 claims by the end of the year. And when the farming industry sought help, uh, convener, to support them through the impact of the exceptional weather this year, our response was, I hope, swift, swift and effective. We made BPS loans available from the 5th of October, three weeks earlier than when we started to do so last year and well before the cap payment window opens on 1st December. We were the first administration in the UK to get that vital cash flowing into the farming industry and the wider rural economy. We have now made 2018 basic payment loan offers to 17,428 customers, that's 99 per cent of eligible applicants, providing up to 90 per cent of their anticipated cap payments, um, Pillar 1 payments, and 341.9 million in total. We have made loan payments to 12,653 businesses, injecting over £294 million into the rural economy. We are absolutely focused on delivering practical support for our rural businesses. We are always looking to do better, convener. We are not complacent, uh, uh, but we uh, are building on a year of real delivery progress. Turning to Brexit, the issues are hugely important to farming. There is no doubt about that. The Scottish Government's overall position remains that staying within the EU is the best option for Scotland and, and we believe, the whole of the UK. Failing that, we believe that the UK and Scotland must remain inside the single market and the customs union. Nonetheless, as a responsible government, we are working hard to prepare for Brexit. We are working to address the technical legislative deficiencies that would present themselves when bringing EU law across into UK law uh, in the event of a no deal. We have worked constructively with DEFRA on this, as the Scottish Government is committed to do. The process of notifying parliamentary committees about relevant statutory instruments is underway. This secondary ledge will ensure that support schemes and payments in their current form can continue after next March, 
even in the event of a no deal. Through our stability and simplicity document, I outlined a detailed policy position up to 2024. By sticking with the main elements of current farm policy during that period, we will give farmers and crofters stability in a time of unprecedented change. In the second half of the period from 2021, we will simplify and improve farm support payments to make them even more effective. So our current assessment is we would need new powers through primary legislation not by next March, convener, but from 2021 onwards. I see the pencil being wagged furiously, uh, and uh, I accept the signal. There was more to say in the statement, but perhaps, convener, uh, I can just leave it there uh, and invite questions from your colleagues. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his observance. Uh, the first question is going to be from Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you mentioned BSE. Um, get right in there. I mean, we have already had a statement on BSE, um, so it doesn't need to be a lengthy discussion, I believe. But I'm particularly interested in the. I believe there's four cohorts, four, four offspring of the cow concerned. Where are we with the investigations and whether they are infected or not? Well, my, my colleague uh, Marie Goujon did, as, as Mr. Chapman knows, give a a statement that the news is hugely disappointing to have the confirmed case in BSE in Aberdeenshire. Um, there is no risk to consumer health, uh, and the Scottish Government have activated plans to protect food safety and, of course, our valuable farming industry. Regarding the investigation, I know that these things properly take time, and that, that is, is, uh, is simply the case. I wonder if, if perhaps Eleanor Mitchell could bring us up to date uh, in relation to any current relevant information, Convener. Yep, so the valuations uh, of the animals affected were completed on the farm on the 26th of October. Yesterday, the three cohort animals and the one offspring were culled on the farm. The carcasses have been transported for sampling and disposal to Dumfries. If the screening results will be available at the end of this week, if, they, if any of them prove positive, then those carcasses will be then transported to the uh, APHE uh, Weybridge offices for further testing. Okay. I think, I think that, that's good. I mean, we've, we've, we're absolutely sure, certain, that there are no other uh, potential animals that could be infected. It's just the, the immediate offspring of this particular cow, and we know exactly where they are, and they've now been taken out. So I think, uh, I think I'm satisfied with that response. Yep. Thank you. We'll move on to our next question, if I may. Uh, Mike Rumbles, I believe that's you. Thank you, Convener. Um, in June, uh, the Cabinet Secretary published his stability and simplicity proposals um, for the, uh, with the consultation in the, for rural funding the transition period up to 2024. And while I appreciate that um, in a very unstable period in an unstable world, it's uh, useful to have stability for our uh, farming industry. But I think the committee is interested to know what the Cabinet Secretary's vision is for the future of Scottish agricultural financial support post the transition period. It's, it's really what, what we'd like to know is what, what he believes it w would be useful for, if, if he's still Cabinet Secretary in that long period of time ahead, what his vision is, how would he like to see the future of agricultural support in Scotland? Well, well I, f first of all, the stability and simplicity paper, I think, does offer um, what it says on the tin, stability and simplicity. And, Whilst we haven't completed the analysis of the responses, we have 137, we've had a huge range of very, very interesting responses. And, and of course, these, these are, will be available to everyone to, to examine and make very good reading. And I think, first of all, it, you know, we've had a consultation out of respect to the 137. We need to treat their responses very seriously. I've spoken to some of the farmers, for example, individually who've replied. Um, you know, secondly, I think the fact that our document is a plan for five years means it actually is the only plan in the UK. Um, with respect, the, the document Health and Harmony uh, only makes one thing clear, that direct payments will cease. We believe in 2027, 28. That's what the UK has said. I, I believe that direct payments will continue to be required, and I think they're justified. And moreover, I, I believe that the farmers already provide public good. Health and Harmony presupposes they don't provide public good, but they should do so. No, they already do. And they already provide public good in many ways, but principally two main ways. One, in producing high-quality food, which I believe is, is the primary role of farming. And in Scotland, that's what 
farmers do. And their Scotch beef and Scotch lamb, the livestock farming, is renowned throughout the world for quality. And secondly, in looking after the landscape, the custodians of the countryside, doing the work, not writing about it, theorizing about it, writing views and polemics about it, but actually doing it every day, shaping the landscape so that it looks as it does, and it, it's the center of our tourism industry. So my vision is that farmers should be allowed and permitted and enabled and supported by the public and respected and valued and appreciated for what they do, not exposed to the line that, well, we'll support you for a wee bit. We haven't quite said how. We've only actually given any details to 222 and 220 for some pillar two payments, and we're going to cut off all your money by 227. That doesn't seem to be a particularly inspiring vision to me. Well, I was just wondering that, I mean, I'm not so much focusing on the transition period to 2024, and I thoroughly understand what the Minister is trying to achieve with that. I'm just really trying to get at, uh, and, and he said some very good things about uh, support for our farming industry, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to get a little bit, dig a little bit more deeply. How, I mean, he, if he's, it could be him, it could be a successor minister, but if, if it was him, you're on the chair now, what, 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 in practical terms, what was your vision post-2020? What would you like to see? Is this an opportunity to do things differently than we're doing at the moment? Because obviously the transition period is just that, and we are going to st basically stick with the forms that we've got. What would you like to see that would be, in the Scottish landscape after 2024, that would be completely different than we have it now? Because surely we've inherited this from, from the European Union, and we've had to obey the European Union rules like it or not, we're going to be free to do our, do our own rules, I would hope. So what, I'm just trying to get what he, what he would like to see post-2024. Well, it's a, it's a fair question. I accept that, convener. I hope I've set out in response to the, the, my vision for the future in general terms. Um, Mr Rumble's asked, what can we do better? I mean, I firmly believe that actually farmers are doing things extremely well in many respects at the moment. But it is clear that there's room for progress in some farms and some farming practices. In general, uh, I think we all want to see um, that more practical greening, greening measures are taken. Um, I think it's also a, clear that in our stability and simplicity consultation, we asked for views to simplify and improve um, the current regime. And we postulated that we would seek to do that in the second part of the five years. So we're not just waiting until 2.24, as Rumbles were, we're envisaging that you know, after the transition period of a couple of years, that we would then move to start to pilot new schemes, to try out new, new systems. Yesterday, yesterday evening, as you know, we had a debate about the, the problems and the difficulties associated with uh, a, a export of live animals. I think there's a consensus in Parliament that we would like to try to encourage, difficult though, though they are financially, as I understand from comments that were made in, during the debate by the farmers amongst the, um, a, the MSPs who spoke. Um, you know, that's one area where I hope that you know, pi pilot schemes could be considered and some measure of support. That's just to take one example. I also think there's a wider question, a series of questions which the National Council of Rural Advisors have set out in their paper that we need to consider. You know, they, they uh, look, are looking to uh, more focus on rural, more appreciation of rural, what rural is about, looking at things in an integrated development fashion, with farmers very much at the heart of that. Uh, and uh, also, you know, I want to encourage, as the NFU does, more productivity and more diversification. Um, and it's invidious to mention successful farming businesses and single one or two out because there's so many. But we can all think of businesses that have started off from you know, one family farm that are now household names. So I want to see and encourage and enable and facilitate the young male and female farmers who are now able to kind of think in a business way and encourage them. I also think, incidentally, that the new South of Scotland enterprise is a, will be an opportunity. We'll come to debate that separately, but it's an opportunity, perhaps, because of the real importance for farming and, and forestry in the south of Scotland to perhaps try out things uh, in, in a way which would be consistent with, I think, Mr Rumble's direction. Um, and uh, I would also like to see us uh, further enhance the excellent marketing activities that, uh, um, 
that are deployed by QMS, by the Scottish Development International with our in-market specialists who, for example, have facilitated market for export of beef to Berlin and Germany through one person representing Scotland and that company and whose efforts have been tremendously successful. Um, and I'd like to make sure that the advice available, all the various advice available from the Scottish SRUC, um, uh, uh, from the Business Gateway and from others is of the top quality and that we can integrate um, more, integrate more agri-forestry uh, to a better extent. Uh, and finally, and this is a long wish list, uh, you know, I'm quite ambitious for Scotland, um, make no apologies for that. I, I would like to see post-Brexit in particular and a freeing up of opportunities for farmers to use the land in terms of planning. I would like to see more permitted developments for farmers to be able to use their initiative, to diversify, to use their land to the best sustainable effect. So I hope that's enough to be going on with, uh, Convener. Uh, yes, um, Mike, before I come back to you, Stuart would like to come in with, uh, with, uh, with I, th I think you've got some more questions, Stuart. Um, I, I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm that uh, uh, with our coming out of the common agricultural policy, which is of course driven by the diverse needs of the north of Finland and the south of uh, Crete, um, that we might avoid things like the three crop rule, which wasn't appropriate for Scotland. We might uh, look at the way in which we use water. There's a huge shortage of water in uh, the Mediterranean areas, whereas if anything, we might have a superfluitive. And that there therefore are some practical things that I think the government's previously referred to that we might see being tackled in a different way as distinct from just the uh, providing finance. Yes, I entirely agree with his points about the three crop rule and you know, I'd point to the good work that was led by Professor Russell Griggs and the Greening Committee and, and that was a committee which brought together you know, farmers and uh, NGOs and they reached a conclusion and that's going ahead in some of the instances. Um, the use of water, well, it's, it's a bigger topic but uh, although not a farmer myself uh, uh, and I bow to the knowledge in this committee um, from the discussions I've had, effective drainage of farmland is something which is mentioned again and again as an absolute essential of productive uh, land. And, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have an opportunity just to kind of mention that fact. Um, and in terms of the provision of support and the rationale, therefore, you know, I do think that because livestock production in Scotland is so important that we have to address ourselves to, to the need for financial support to be made available to ensure that we can continue to support high quality, high quality, environmentally sound livestock production in Scotland. And that, that does, with respect, convener, seem to be a fundamental difference between the Scottish Government and the UK Government's proposals. Thank you, convener. Yeah, Minister, you said that um, you're still analysing, and want to be fair to the respondents, to the consultation, the stability and simplicity consultation. But could you tell us when the final plans for the period to 2024, we might expect them to be published? Um, well, I, I, you know, I can say we're, we're analysing the res, res, responses. Um, I'd hope to bring the process of analysis to a conclusion as soon as possible. Uh, I can also say that we promise a simplification um, body that would take things forward, and we're um, in touch with a number of individuals about that, so I would hope to make an announcement. I don't want to make a time limit because I haven't. Uh, I know that that will then be a sort of noose around my neck, but I, but I, I know, perish the thought. Uh, who would ever do that? Um, look, I, I want to do this as quickly as possible, but we have to give respect to the fact that we've had 137 very serious proposals, some of which uh, have been extremely well thought through. And I think they really are uh, a number of tools in the box. Uh, and I hope that, that when members can um, have the opportunity to study them for themselves, they will see that the public have sent in some really excellent suggestions which we will be able to incorporate. So, so I would hope it would be um, a, you know, as soon as possible to answer Mr Rumble's question. OK, I mean, I've been asked to pursue this next one. And that's my last question, I think. Uh, under uh, Pillar 2 in the consultation, um, that, you know, you do say that many schemes will continue, and you've conf confirmed that. That's your hope. But which schemes do you, I mean, without, which schemes do you plan to close if 
if any, and if you do plan to close them, why would you be thinking of closing them? Well, I, 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 I'm not, uh, I don't have any plan to close particular schemes. I think the whole idea of stability is that we keep the existing schemes going uh, so far as we can financially. Um, and, you, you know, we, we have to, to, to look carefully at the figures. Um, but there, there are obviously some that we regard as a priority. Um, one, one priority very clearly for Scotland is the LFAS scheme. Um, and we've set out in our, in our stability and simplicity consultation. Uh, can, can, can I just say, Alfas is, is, is actually going to come up, up in a minute. Okay. So if, if I could divert you from that subject uh, so that I don't upset the deputy convener in due course. <laughs> well, I don't want to upset anybody. I never perish the thought. Other questions, if I may, just with this, and I'll come back to Mike on that if he wants to, but Colin, you wanted to ask a specific question, and then I'm going to come to Peter. Thanks, Convener. You've obviously proposed a Cabinet Secretary a simplification task force, and I think you are keen to know um, when full details of that will be announced. But just the general point, I mean, that will have quite a narrow remit, um, that, that particular task force, and you've had, and you've, you've described some of them today, various uh, different groups that you've appointed, Agriculture Champions, the Greg's Greening Group, the National Council of Rural Advisors. But it, it seems to me that, that all these groups, and, and also the Simplification Task Force, um, don't have a very specific remit to report on what future farm payments sh should look like. Is there not a case for a more encompassing task force that brings all the stakeholders together and looks in detail specifically at what future payments should look like and reports on that, rather than all these various bodies uh, and, and what is probably going to be quite a, a, a narrow remit for the simplification task force? Shouldn't you have a more all-encompassing task force that looks at all these issues and reports in detail exactly what we believe that future farm payments should look like? <coughs> well, our, our proposal, and, and uh, you know, I can say it's had broad support in the consultation responses, has been we provide a period of stability where the, the, con the existing payment schemes continue. I think that's actually what most farmers and land managers want. We are really talking about the period of post-24, as Mr Rumbles has rightly said. Uh, and in respect of that, I do agree that, uh, that uh, a focused effort involving all relevant people and stakeholders uh, is something that, that uh, is worthy of consideration and will probably be required in due course. Uh, but the work that the NCRA have done, the Agri Champions, Agri -Champions have done, um, the former at the behest of the Scottish Parliament, was actually for a very specific remit, and they have discharged that remit, and they have looked at matters in principle, and they have advised us about the principles um, around which we should um, plan future support. So that was the initial stage. The Simplification Task Force has got a more specific remit, and incidentally, I mean, I've chaired a lot of task forces. The clearer the remit, the more the likelihood that you get um, a, set, a set of answers that can then be turned into action rather than a very vague remit which uh, t takes you nowhere. So um, a, in response to the question about time scale, we expect to complete the analysis of the simplification responses, Mr Smith, um, by mid-November. Um, we will then prioritise and bring the findings to the external stakeholder panel uh, and the first meeting of the panel is planned to be at the end of November, beginning of December. So prior to that, we, we would make an announcement of uh, those on the panel. Um, Ian and Douglas here, my officials, uh, um, uh, are leading the initial simplification work, and they may wish, if members of, if we have time, convener, Perhaps either Ian or Douglas could add to that because it's, it is a very important issue. Um, can I, Cabinet Secretary, just before they do, I think Colin wants to focus on one area which may then allow you to bring them in. So, Colin. I think the detail on the simplification task would, would, would be good, but I'll encourage back the Cabinet Secretary. It seems to be saying there is um, a view that a, a wider remit, a wider task force looking at that future support, not immediate support, future support, is something that is seriously considering. Uh, on that issue, you've talked about a motion coming before Parliament to bring effectively all parties together um, to look at, I suppose, those wider issues. Do you know when that's likely to, to happen? Because that may be a forum for putting the detail on establishing this task yeah. force. Well, I, I have committed to debate. You're absolutely right. And I think that debate should take place before the, the end of the year. I, I have 
to say, and this is not a plea in mitigation, but the huge volume of work which the clerk will be aware about uh, statutory instruments to prepare for a no-deal Brexit has been taking an enormous amount of time, and I expect will take an awful lot of Parliament's time as a whole. But be that as it may, we're committed to a debate before the, the turn of the year. Uh, I'm not saying that I think necessarily that a, a grouping uh, along the lines that Mr Smith is suggesting should be formed immediately. I think there's a sequential nature about how we proceed here. Uh, and I do think that certain basics need to be established. For example, you know, will the UK commit, as they did promise in the pre-Brexit, pre pre-referendum, and as a Brexit, indeed, pledge, campaigning pledge, will rural funding for rural Britain be matched at the levels that we came to expect from Europe? Because without some assurance as to whether that's the case, it's difficult, really, to plan post-24. Um, what we know is that direct payments are to, to be scrapped. The Treasury have been very, very abrupt about that. I mean, there's no jubility about this. Go and speak to Liz Truss. <coughs> Farmers are not to get payments from 227. Uh, DEFRA put a paper out in 2005 indicating that this was the direction of travel. So this is not new. And I think, convener, that you know, before we set up an elaborate process of deciding what schemes we have, we, we kind of need to know what the overall commitment to rural Britain is, because you can't make a plan without knowing whether you're to spend, you know, um, 100 pounds or 10 pounds or 50 pounds. I mean, we need to have some cooperation. And, and I've asked Mr. Gove if he'd be kind enough to clarify this on the record in Hansard in the course of the UK Agriculture Bill. So, so I'm certainly willing to cooperate with Mr. Smith's suggestion, but I, I'm not persuaded yet that we're quite at the position where we've got enough information usefully to initiate that work. Okay, Peter, you wanted to a question. Yeah, I mean, it follows on, I think, from Collins about simplification. It's a, it's a particularly a focused point, but it's one that creates a lot of grief in, in the farming community. And this is the, the on-farm inspection, the compliance inspections, and the horrendous penalties that something, something can result from genuine mistakes. You know, I know this creates huge problems, huge anxiety in the farming industry that we, we recognise these, these checks need to happen, but the, the, the consequences of genuine mistakes, these are law-abiding, uh, honest people, uh, it can be absolutely horrendous. Can you give us some idea that some of the, these, uh, uh, some of these uh, di difficulties can be overcome uh, as a result of Brexit? Well, you know, I'm sympathetic to the view that, that Mr Chapman has just expressed, and I've heard the very same arguments frequently from many farmers and crofters. And I'm particularly sympathetic to the um, thesis that the penalty regime for clerical or honest administrative errors is far too harsh. Um, and indeed, in the Stability and Simplicity paper, we specifically indicate that we think both of those issues, the penalty regime and inspection, should be looked at. We have had a number of very useful responses. Interestingly, a number of responses have actually pointed to the need for inspections. I mean, if we're to have, you know, and this is changing tack slightly, but I mean, if, if we're to have the high surveillance that resulted in the detection of a BSE case, we need to have a very effective surveillance regime. We've got that. If we didn't, we wouldn't have detected the case, convener, and goodness knows what, what the consequences of that would have been. Um, so inspections are necessary, and the many of the correspondents that I've seen have made that point, but there are so many inspections, a plethora, and the nature and timing of them at times when, uh, you know, when it's interfering with gathering sheep and, and all the rest of it and you know, having to bring in sheep for counting and all the rest. I mean, uh, all of these things are the source of a great number of complaints and dissatisfaction. But overall, we need to have an effective in, in a regime. And I do think that this will be part of the, the um, locus, the remit of the regime. Actually, both Douglas and Ian can actually talk talk a lot more about that if uh, they want to accept the invitation. It, it, Ian, if you want to come in briefly, I mean, I am stacking up questions quickly, so... Uh, <coughs> Ian. <laughs> um, what, what, what we've done so far uh, in, in taking this forward is, is canvassed our staff on the ground, uh, if we're dealing with farmers on a day-to-day on a -day basis, to get ideas or thoughts on simplification where, where that can be made easy. Um, we have over 300 ideas 
put in front of us. We only received them about 10 days ago. So we have a team in place that's going through them, looking at what's almost possible now without changes to legislation, what might have to wait until we can make some decisions of our own. So we're really encouraged by, by the number of ideas that are coming forward. And later this week, Douglas and I are meeting with our delivery partners in Scottish National Heritage, uh, SEPA and Forestry Commission um, to canvas ideas from them. So it's really been a, a a very encouraging uh, piece of work, and that will then form the basis of which we take to the external panel. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Richard, you wanted to come in briefly. Uh, uh, recap payments. So, in layman's terms, we will lose all EU funding after Brexit, and if the UK government don't come up with funding, the Scottish government will possibly have to put this funding into the future budgets. Am I correct or not? I think, uh, putting it starkly, but broadly, Broadly true, we, we, you know, we, we are fearful about the termination of direct support payments. We believe that they serve a valuable role that's necessary and that farmers should be appreciated more for what they do and they deserve them. Uh, and after all, we're all public servants in different ways. Many people, even in the private sector, receive money from the state for differing purposes uh, to single out farmers in, in a way that they're undeserved recipients of this money, I think is particularly unfair. So I hope that um, in the course of the debates that are going on, that you know, a, a reasonable conclusion can be arrived at, convener. Uh, and uh, if, if not, then you know, it's very difficult for me as a cabinet minister to see how we could find hundreds of millions of pounds from elsewhere in the budget. Uh, that is not something that is generally possible for any government for obvious reasons. If we had hundreds of millions of pounds that was sloshing around unallocated, you'd be the first to say that we weren't doing our job properly. So, by definition, it is up to the UK government, who's, after all, was had the idea of the Brexit referendum and made the promises about matching the funding on the, on the side of a bus. So, uh, it's really up to them, I think, to come up with some better answers on the level of funding. And, you know, I've, I've been um, making this point, I think, uh, since the referendum, well, actually, yes, literally since the day after the referendum. <laughs> Could we move on to the next subject, which is uh, the Deputy Convener would like to ask you on? Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, obviously, you're aware of the importance of the less favoured area support scheme. So I'm going to give you a chance to speak about it now. Um, the funding in the scheme is due to reduce from £65.5 million this year, possibly to as low as £13 million in 2020. And stakeholders are rightly concerned about the potential reduction and loss of this funding. So what options have you explored to prevent uh, Elfas funding from being cut? And are there any contingency plans being put in place in case this does actually reduce? Yes. Well, Gail Ross is absolutely right, and LFAS payments are particularly important in, um, in uh, the, the north of Scotland. Her own, her own um, con constituency, for example, um, we've made it clear in the stability and simplicity document that it's unacceptable that we see LFAS reduced payments reduced to, to 20%. But, but those are the, the rules of the scheme. And therefore, what we have indicated in our consultation paper is that we need to find, a, if, if you like, a, a workaround uh, to enable recipients, broadly speaking. Uh, and we haven't made, and I don't want to make specific commitments here, I'm not doing that, because this is work in progress and no decisions have been made. But our desire, our aim, is to work with the industry, especially the uh, NFU, um, Beef and Sheep Associations in order to find a workaround uh, in order effectively to maintain the level of support that's going into the, less, the, the least favoured areas at a level which is sufficient to maintain rural um, development, in, particularly in the most remote parts of Scotland, and Gail Ross represents a very large tranche of them. That's our objective, convener. It's not an easy one to achieve. I believe it is achievable, and we have the goodwill of the stakeholders in committing to do that, so we're working closely with them. In August, I met with the NFUS Less Favoured Area Committee in Granton and Spey, 
and my officials met with them again earlier this month, and officials have also met with other stakeholders, including Crofters, National Sheep and Beef Association. So this is, this is work in progress, and I undertake to keep the committee informed of the progress that we make in that work. Okay, that's fine. Um, yes, Maureen. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important, Cabinet Secretary, that we know what uh, the UK Agriculture Bill says in terms of ALFAS, because at the moment it's still under their jurisdiction and will be for some time. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm, I'm advised, and I just was checking this there, there is nothing in the bill about um, less favoured area schemes, and, and uh, it is the case that, the, that down south the equivalent LFAS scheme was scrapped, I think, around seven years ago. Um, it's because we have this devolved parliament that we have LFAS. Um, it's been supported by all parties, so far as I'm aware, because it provides a purpose of keeping the lights on in rural Scotland, keeping school roles going, and the most remote communities have farmers and crofters at their heart. So for all these reasons, I'm just summarised, uh, I, th I hope there's a will across all members to, to find a practical way to continue to support the people that need it most. Peter, you wanted to come in. Well, I, ju I just wanted to tie you down a wee bit more, Cabinet Secretary. Are you saying, let's be clear, are you, are you saying that you intend to continue payments, whether it's called LFAS or something else, at the same level in 2019 and 2020 as is, is currently in place? I mean, is that what you're saying you intend to do? Well, um, well, first of all, it, you know, this year, we, we, uh, as soon as we became aware that we were permitted to do so, we restored LFAS to 100% from the 80%, which hitherto had been the steer. Uh, the European Parliament intervened to allow the payments to be maintained 100%. So we acted, and we acted very quickly, actually, and I took tough decisions that enabled me to, to do that, to maintain LFAS. The payment reduction is to 80% next year, and I... I I, I don't think that we, we can prevent that from happening, but a reduction from 80% to 20% convener is what I think is just not acceptable. It's just not acceptable, and that's why I've said so, sticking my neck out. Uh, I'm not going to stick my neck out further at, at this stage in case someone decides to, exert, to apply the guillotine to it, so I hope you forgive me for, for that self-preservation instinct. Um, but, you know, seriously, I am determined to, to find a workaround my officials are working very hard on this. I think it's within our reach. Uh, I hope we're approaching this in a practical way. There's many, many other issues in, involved here about, about LFAS uh, uh, as a scheme, and no one is saying that it's perfect in every, in every way. Uh, so we do need to have a, a hard and close look at how it operates and who benefits from it and make sure that those who most need continue to benefit. But, um, but uh, you know, my, my, uh, my stated intention is to find a workaround to prevent it going down from 20% um, the year after next. OK, I think we'll move on to the next question. Uh, John, that's you. Thanks, Convener. And um, the UK Agriculture Bill has already been mentioned, so I just wonder, Cabinet Secretary, if you could say something about your uh, view of the UK Agriculture Bill and whether it could or should include measures concerning Scotland. Um, well, um, you know, I think the starting point is that agriculture has devolved. I mean, we, we have been making decisions about agriculture. If it wasn't devolved, would there still be an LFAS scheme, just going back to the previous? We have used our powers under devolution to do something that we all believe is necessary, and it's different, it's diverged from the UK policy. So I think the, the principle is this is a devolved area, and it should continue to be devolved. And any um, move away from that is something that, that we believe is wrong in principle. Um, nonetheless, we recognise that we want to be, and we have been, I hope, I have been constructive and engaging with the UK, particularly in the UK DA meetings, and my officials have carried out a huge amount of work with DEFRA. That has, that has been very fruitful. There are reasonable relations at all levels, I hope. Um, but there are three sticking points, and I don't know whether you want me to mention them now. I mean, I went over this ground in detail yesterday with uh, the counterpart, select, Pete, uh, Pete Wishart's committee, select committee. No, no. Um, committee. But basically, there are three areas where we believe that the powers of this parliament would be predated, if you like, um, and we don't think that's acceptable. And there are particular risks involved in, in that. The three areas are basically W... w uh, TO, producers, organisations and uh, 
uh, marketing, fair, fair dealing in respect of market developments. Now, in particular, the WTO is, is, a, is a complex issue, but basically it's a reserved issue. But in its implementation, it's devolved. That's essentially the argument. Uh, and um, perhaps, I mean, I, I won't dwell on this. I could talk for, for a, a long, long time in this convener. You don't want me to do that. What I would just make in conclusion is this. The decision that we took that these three areas were devolved was not my decision. It came from legal advice. And I, you know, I want to put it to you, this was not me playing at politics at all. It wasn't the Scottish Government being political. Quite the opposite. We have very clear legal advice that the bill as it's drafted will take away powers from this institution. Uh, and our response has been to seek to argue and persuade the UK Government to amend the bill so that it doesn't do that. And it's my hope that those efforts, which are still continuing, will be successful. Uh, and thus far, the UK have not provided, as we have, any justification for their argument. And incidentally, an LCM has been lodged with Parliament, and you will have it, and it sets out our, our arguments in, in a great deal of detail, as is our, our duty and is right and proper. Cabinet Secretary, uh, can I just note on the LCM that it is a matter that will be discussed by the, the committee, I believe, next week, um, as, as we've only recently got it. Uh, John's very uh, kindly agreed that I can ask you a couple of questions, if I may, on the WTO agreement on agriculture. That's part seven of the UK Agriculture Bill. Um, could you just confirm at the moment who is the person who negotiates while we're in the EU with the WTO? Well, look, I, I, th th these are pretty technical issues, and I've been well briefed on them, but I think to save time, it might be better if David uh, Barnes were to give the answer to this technical I'm, question. I'm very happy if David wants to answer, but, but I'm, I'm trying to make them very simple questions so that they would require short answers. So who negotiates on behalf of the EU with the WTO? Uh, Chairman, if, if I may, the, the problem with simple, precise questions is that they might only pick out one small element of a complex landscape. So the position uh, is that under the EU's common commercial policy, on all trade policy issues, it's the European Commission that negotiates on behalf of the European Union and the Member States. That, however, does not mean that, the, that, that accountability, legal responsibility and, and so on all automatically uh, fall to the European Commission as well. Apologies if I'm, if I'm jumping ahead and, and answering a question you haven't asked, but it is a very complicated position. So the negotiation, your precise question, the negotiation is done by the uh, European Commission and there are uh, arrangements, bureaucratic arrangements, whereby the, the member states effectively give the mandate to the European Commission. So the okay. Commission doesn't set the negotiating policy, but it carries out it carries the negotiations. Negotiation. So at the moment, could you give me uh, the, for example, direct payment to farmers are covered by the amount of money that is put in under the aggregate measure of support? Could you confirm to me what the current level of the aggregate measure of support is for the EU, and does it allow us to pay farmers in the way that we want to with direct support? Uh, the way Europe European policies have been designed, um, the direct payments all fall either under the green or blue categories in the WTO, uh, for which no limit applies, provided the scheme in question meets the rules of that category. The aggregate measure of support is a, 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 it is a complicated issue. The aggregate measure of support is a limit that applies to the amber category, and uh, none of the direct payments, uh, I, I think I'm correct in saying, I might double check my text, but I'm 99% sure that none of, certainly none of the current direct payments in Scotland fall into that category, therefore are subject to the uh, uh, aggregate uh, measure of support okay. limit. But, but post-Brexit, direct payments to farmers will fall under the amber box, is my understanding. Is that correct? Uh, convener, that wouldn't be an automatic thing. It would depend entirely on the design of the scheme. Okay. The point that is uh, under dispute or a point of concern for the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers in the way the, uh, the DEFRA Agriculture Bill has been drafted is uh, is about the decision, who would get to take the decision okay. about which 
uh, category particular schemes would or wouldn't okay. fall into. So the, the, the line I was trying to take you down is, is the uh, post-Brexit, the UK have asked uh, the World Trade Organization for a, the ability to make payments of up to £5.9 billion in direct payments in subsidies, which is approximately 83% of what the EU is paying across all of the EU. So my point on that is, is that there's ample scope within the funds that are put apart should direct payments to farmers fall under the amber box. Now, based on that, and based on the fact that the EU is currently negotiating, and based on the evidence that we heard from Michael Gope uh, earlier in the year, the powers actually to negotiate with the WTO will have to remain with the UK government because they are uh, uh, the signature to it. And Michael Gove has said, and it says in the Agriculture Bill, that the UK will consult with the other organisations, uh, the devolved administrations. Why are you worried about what, what, what it says in uh, Part 7 of the UK Agriculture Bill? To me, I can't follow it. And I've looked at it carefully over numerous occasions, and, uh, and I've taken advice on it. Um, convenient, yes. A number of... Uh questions in there. The, um, one of the other concerns of uh, Scottish ministers, is, excuse me if I look slightly discombobulated, it's because I'm, your last comment about the, uh, a requirement to consult, and unless the text has changed uh, since I last looked at it, the, one of our concerns is that there wasn't even a requirement to consult, let alone have the consent of the um, the devolved administrations. The, um, I know there's the, the, there have been uh, discussions, and all the devolved administrations have been uh, have been pushing the UK government on uh, on this. The Scottish government is is not in any way questioning that the negotiation of international obligations, including WTO obligations, is a reserved matter. The Cabinet Secretary said that a, a, a few moments ago. There, there is no issue at all about the negotiation. The issue is entirely about the implementation of those uh, international um, obligations, and the legislative consent memorandum sets out uh, the Scottish Government's position based, as the Cabinet Secretary said, on legal advice, which is essentially that if an area of policy is devolved, then once an international obligation has been negotiated, the implementation of that in a devolved administration's territory is a devolved matter. Now, there may be certain things that have to be done that, only, that it makes sense to do for the UK as a whole rather than in four separate decisions, but that in itself doesn't, in our understanding, change the devolution settlement and suddenly flip something into being reserved. So, for example, in, if, let, let's say hypothetically there were to be future support of some kind in Scotland which fell into the amber box, it may be the case, as, as you say, convener, that there is a great deal of headroom in there. But as things stand, the amount of headroom that Scotland would have would be the result of an allocation to Scotland, which under the bill would be made unilaterally by the Secretary of State. Uh, so there again, the, uh, the, the view of devolved ministers is that if this is a devolved policy area, that devolution should be respected, and e even if something has to be done on a UK-wide basis, uh, if it's a devolved area of policy, that should be agreed amongst the, uh, the administrations and not carried out unilaterally uh, by the UK government. But the details are in the legislative consent. Okay, but, but, but I mean, the, the point to me is, and perhaps we're going to le leave it on this, the point to me is that, that Michael Gove has said that agriculture and agricultural support is a matter for the Scottish government because it's devolved. <coughs> There is that much headroom in the amount of money that can be paid uh, under the uh, amber box that, as classed by the World Trade Organization that we'd have to be as big as really frankly the whole of the EU to use up the allocation we've needed. So it appears we're seeing um, problems that, that don't actually exist. I'm going to come back to John because I think you've got some more questions on that. Yeah, well, well thanks, convener. Um, yeah, mine are perhaps more general nature. The convener's gone down a specific route. Um, I mean, you were saying before in your last answer to me, Cabinet Secretary, that there was these three areas that you were looking for amendments to the UK Agriculture Bill. C could you just spell out for me, who's not a farmer, but in kind of simple terms, you know, if these amendments are taken, how will that practically impact on our Scottish farmers? And if they are not taken, how will that practically impact on our Scottish farmers? Um, 
Well, those, those three areas have been identified by senior legal advisers, and the dialogue is continuing. And you know, I have no wish to fall out with the UK government over technical matters. And the whole approach and a huge amount of effort is going in to try to reach agreement on these things and focus on the real substantive important issues. Um, what would the, the impact be? Well, um, in, re in relation to the WTO, uh, Mr Barnes has already indicated that decisions could be taken by the UK government which uh, may have an impact on our ability to continue to, continue to make uh, coupled payments or voluntary coupled payments. And given the importance of livestock farming, I think in principle that is wrong. Uh, even if the convener is correct about the nature of the dispensation, that may be the case now. It may not be the case in the future. And if we agree to this, we will be forfeiting powers on the basis of legal advice. Secondly, in relation to producers' organisations, um, we would not be able to set up a producer organisation in Scotland without say-so from the UK government. Um, that seems to me to be absurd, and it runs contrary to the practice of where the producer organisation Angus Growers was de-recognised, the legal action was taken against the Scottish Government. If, if it wasn't a devolved function, why was it not taken against the, the UK Government? Um, I don't want to overplay these, but there are risks, but they're not the greatest risks. The greatest risks are to do with other political matters. And in that respect, convener, as well as the three specific areas, I've also asked the UK Government add various things to the bill, add a commitment about clarifying the funding to answer Mr Lyle's point, make it clear on the record in Hansard what level of funding there will be. Secondly, the red meat levy, uh, and I'm pleased that an amendment is now being brought forward, albeit by backbencher. This is not backbencher territory. Uh, uh, and whilst the amendment is, uh, uh, we've just got it, we think that it's unsatisfactory in several respects. This, this means that in a practical way, a couple of million quid is being lost to market Scotch beef and Scotch lamb. Now, we could do an awful lot. We really need that funding, and it's money attributable to Scottish livestock. It's a long-standing issue that has not been resolved, and this bill should resolve it, uh, and I hope that that will take place. Geographical indicators are not in the bill. They should be in the bill, and the UK appear to be seeking to use this as, uh, as a lever. And finally, we're all concerned that post-Brexit there could be a free-for-all with the importation of cheap meat, chlorinated chicken, uh, and a meat produce which has been produced in countries which don't have the high standards that pertain in the UK under the EU legislative frameworks. And therefore, we would have liked to have seen in this bill a requirement that prior to the importation of any such meat produce, relevant certification and evidence would have to be produced and demonstrated that any such meat produce or other foodstuffs had been produced in accordance with the high welfare, hygiene and other regulatory standards. And they haven't agreed to that, although, to be fair, I think they have said that will be in a trade bill. Um, so there's other things which are not taking powers away, but which we think, from Scotland's interests, convener, should be in the bill, but which currently are not. Is the main concern that there will be, we want Scottish Government, Parliament, even farmers will not have the same powers that they had to, to act? Or is the main concern that uh, the funding is going to be so reduced that uh, we can't pass that on to farmers? Or is it a mixture of both? Well, it's a mixture of both. That's great. Thanks. OK. Um, the next question is Peter. Peter. And just to follow on in, the, in the, your, your amendments, the proposed amendments to the Agricultural Bill, the clauses 22 to 26, um, how has the UK government responded to your proposed amendments uh, on these matters, Cabinet Secretary? Well, um, uh, Mr Gove, when I suggested that, that he should, uh, uh, in the course of the bill, um, clarify um, what was promised by him during the Brexit referendum, uh, replied by saying that it was a very good point. <laughs> um, but he hasn't actually uh, done what I asked, namely to make a statement in Hansard. Uh, and this, this perhaps trumps everything to rural Britain. It's not only Scotland because I assume that farmers down south will be starting to get increasingly worried about you know, future support levels because they don't know beyond 222. So that's number one. And number two, the red meat levy, we were promised that it will be dealt with in the bill. We've just received convener of the backbench amendment. We're looking at that. So that's an element of progress, but it has to be satisfactory. It has to work. It has to repatriate the money that is attributable to Scottish livestock. On geographical indicators, 
Um, there has been uh, no agreement to deal with this in the course of the bill. Uh, and lastly, moving to the three topics, the uh, WTO, producers, organisations and uh, um, fair, fair dealing and marketing. Um, I think the, the key point I make, just to be brief, is we have provided the justification for our arguments. Our lawyers and our LCM says why we have come to these conclusions. The UK government haven't shared their reasoning, their rationale, their justification. They've only made an assertion. I don't think that's good enough. So I've written to them, inviting them to set out their reasons for why they believe that these three matters are wholly reserved. And I hope, convener, that that will lead to uh, a continuing positive dialogue and ultimately a resolution of these issues. That's, that, that, would, that is my preference. Peter, but just before we come back, just clarity, you say you've written to the UK government. Could you just confirm to the committee when you wrote to them? Well, I've written to them on numerous occasions, and uh, 24th of the 24th of October was the amendment letter. Um, yeah, uh, I've got it. Uh, I, I've got it here. So, you know, this, this is just a detail, but you know, we, we have been in respectful, continuous engagement. I mean, I've met with Mr. Gove, Mr. Eustace, and oh, eight or ten occasions, and Ms. Led Mrs. Ledson before that, and um, we have regular meetings and that's that's absolutely appropriate because although we disagree with the fundamentals about Brexit we've got a duty to prepare um, prepare for the worst from our perspective Mr Chapman and we take that duty very seriously we're not slacking you know we we are spending a huge amount of time and and you guys are about to spend an even greater amount of time as I understand it uh, with the triple SIs <laughs> to carry on the conversation on that. You, you say you, would, you, you want to get a, an agreement, but what happens if there is no agreement between this, this government and, and Westminster? Well, um, what's the next step? Well, the, uh, agriculture is a devolved matter. We are perfectly capable of legislating for ourselves. There is no technical problem here. There is no, we are not prevented from doing anything by the fact that we don't agree to the UK Agriculture Bill. Um, uh, again, this is a matter for legal advice, but I'm absolutely certain that uh, if we don't agree to this bill, there's no deleterious impacts that will affect farming in any way whatsoever, simply by virtue of our not agreeing to the bill. That is a complete and utter red herring, and I dealt with that extensively yesterday to the Select Committee, and sadly there has been some scaremongering going on by Tory MPs uh, based on completely false analysis of the factual legal position and therefore, I'm arranging for a legal opinion to be provided to this committee and to the select committee, setting out precisely why uh, any claims that there would be any detrimental impact on farmers simply by virtue of our not agreeing to this bill is completely and manifestly ill-founded. Um, just finally, you have decided to bring forward a legislative consent memorandum on the bill but you haven't brought forward a motion. Uh, can you explain the thinking behind that? Well, um, you know, I, ha I haven't looked closely at the parliamentary procedure. I was very concerned that, incidentally, we, we supplied the LCM. We, get, we got dispensation to do so a bit later than would normally be the case because of the complexity. Here it is here. It's a complex document. I, I'm in the hands of, of Parliament. You know, we will do what is right to do. But, but I was initially concerned to make sure that we set out basically our reasoning on a series of pretty complex topics. Uh, and of course, any further proceedings, for example, responding to this committee when you consider the LCM, as I think you indicated you're planning to do, can be in the next week. Maybe the next process is that after you do that, then we, we have a dialogue about it then. But, but you know, that, that really is a detail. The, the, the more important things are we're seeking to cooperate with the UK government. If we don't and there's no agreement, that doesn't affect farmers detrimentally. It's very, very important to make that clear uh, because there has been, sadly, I'm afraid to say, quite a lot of scaremongering. Just, Cabinet Secretary, just to clarify uh, for other people who may be watching, we have actually got the legislative consent memorandum, and I think the point was uh, that, that w there is no motion attached to that, and that's something that the committee will have to consider next week and consider how to take that forward, because that would have 
actually made it uh, perhaps easier for the committee to move forward. But that, that's a matter for another committee meeting. And I think the next question I'm going to take is from Maureen. Maureen. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, you will be aware that uh, uh, NFUS uh, are concerned that there may not be any legal vehicle for delivering payments beyond the 29th of March 2019. Um, for the record, Cabinet Secretary, can you give your um, thinking on this? Yes, well, I, obviously we, we've had a, a great deal of dialogue with the, the NFU uh, and you know, we, we've been absolutely all over this uh, and uh, we are absolutely satisfied that there is no problem with continuing to make all payments that are properly due to farmers and crofters. And moreover, in addition, in due course, uh, a, a post, uh, uh, post the transition period, in the event that it, it is just determined and agreed that there should be changes to the CAP, then uh, there will be no problem about enabling that to happen in the absence of a UK bill. So, you know, I'm absolutely satisfied, convener, that for very good legal reasons, and I've already indicated we will share, uh, uh, we will provide you with the legal advice in copper plate and in detail, because I could talk about this um, for a long time, but I'm absolutely persuaded by the detailed advice that I have had over the past week or so occasioned because of all the scaremongering that's been going on, that it's completely unfounded. And I do hope that once the legal advice is shared, that members, if they, uh, if they look at it, will come to the same conclusion as me and get on with the real issues and not side issues. Farmers and crofters will continue to receive their payments. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, that's, as you know, uh, 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 my priority as the Cabinet Secretary to, to deal with. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question then is Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. So just to follow on from uh, Maureen Watts' uh, question, uh, and, and for the benefit of this committee, uh, I know you spoke at great length on this yesterday, can you outline to this parliamentary committee uh, which legal framework the Scottish Government will use to deliver support payments beyond March 2019? Okay. Uh, well, there's a sort of tripartite answer to this, and I'll ask David to to answer, if I may. David Barnes. Yes. Um, convener, the strategy that the UK government announced some long time ago that it would adopt was one to take the, the entire body of European law, including the common agricultural policy, and roll it into domestic law at the point where that was necessary. Um, because it was simply impossible to replace the entire body of European law with domestic law uh, in that time frame. So uh, that was the UK government strategy. Scottish ministers, as, as the Cabinet Secretary reminded us, would rather not be in this position at all, but pragmatically uh, took the decision that in the circumstances we're in, they would follow the same strategy. Um, the date at which that becomes necessary depends on whether there is a deal or no deal, but that doesn't affect the legal instruments. So the continuity bill that uh, passed through the Scottish Government and the EU Withdrawal Act that went through the Westminster uh, Parliament both carry out that act of taking the entire body of European law and rolling it into domestic law. Now, just doing that verbatim causes some technical difficulties because, for example, all the references to the EU institutions don't really make sense uh, in domestic law. So there is a huge programme of work that the Cabinet Secretary's mentioned uh, that will hit your committee very soon. Uh, my colleagues have been discussing this with the clerks already. A programme of secondary legislation, statutory instruments, to make those technical corrections so that when European law is rolled into uh, domestic law, uh, it will function properly. Uh, and a big programme of work on that, as I mentioned, will be coming to your, uh, your committee very soon. Um, and we've been working closely with the, the UK government and colleagues in DEFRA on that. So when all of that is done, whether it is needed for next March or whether it is needed for a later date as a result of a withdrawal agreement, in effect, the common agricultural policy will exist in domestic law and therefore we can carry on using it and that will be the legal base. And convening your notice in all of that, I haven't mentioned 
the DEFRA Agriculture Bill because I haven't needed to, because, as the Cabinet Secretary explained, it's a, it's a red herring. That's, that's for other things. For the purposes of the immediate continuity, it's the legal instruments that I, and the, the, the strategy that I've just described. Cabinet Secretary, you, you, you suggested there, were, there was a three-pronged answer, I, I think. Did you want to bring somebody else in? Well, there's, there's a, a no-deal scenario. There's the continuity bill and there's a withdrawal bill. That's what I meant. Yeah. OK. Sorry, Jamie. So th thank you for that, that long answer. Um, just to, just to uh, summarise that then, so you're, you're saying that the Scottish Government is relying on the EU withdrawal bill, the past year Westminster, and the continuity bill which uh, the Scottish Government pursued in the Scottish Parliament. Isn't it the case, however, that the continuity bill is undergoing uh, some legal concerns at the moment over its validity? So do you have any concerns that if the Supreme Court were to deem that an invalid piece of leg legislation, that would interrupt this uh, seamless flow that you spoke of. That's the first question. And secondly, uh, isn't it the case that the situation you just described only allows for continuation of the status quo? In other words, that only allows the Scottish Government to continue to make cap payments under the current cap regime. My question is beyond 2019, what legal framework will the Scottish Government use to deviate from that to be able to deliver to Scottish farm, farm payments, given that it's choosing not to participate in the UK's agricultural bill? I don't think you've answered that question yet. Uh, yes, to take the second part first, convener, the, the Cabinet Secretary um, reminded us that in stability and simplicity, uh, he set out a, uh, a five-year plan with two phases in it, and it would be in the second phase that uh, changes would, be, would begin to be made. Uh, and therefore, those powers would not be needed under that plan. Those powers would not be needed even in a no-deal scenario uh, in 2019. Uh, on the first question, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, said that uh, we'll, we'll send in the detailed legal position. My understanding of the Scottish Government's legal understanding is that uh, the outcome of the, clearly the, the Scottish Government hopes for uh, success uh, for the continuity bill through the Supreme Court process, but my understanding is that uh, the outcome would make no difference to this precise issue about continuity of powers to make farm payments. Okay, yeah, but you have just said that you're relying on the withdrawal bill and the continuity bill as the legal basis in which you can continue to make cap payments. One of the elements of that is being contested. You're saying that regardless of the outcome of that uh, uh, verdict, the, you can rely solely then on the withdrawal bill uh, being incorporated into domestic legislation to allow you to make those payments. And I don't think you quite answered the second question, which was, under which legal framework, given the absence of participation in the UK Agricultural Bill, you will be able to make different types of payments outside of the CAP regime? That's still unclear. Uh, yes, again, on the, so on the point of the, uh, the, the Continuity Bill and the, the Withdrawal Act, yes, absolutely, it's the case that one of those is subject to uh, court proceedings, but the other one isn't. Uh, so, in effect, as I said, I'm not a lawyer, but in layman's terms, uh, if, if, if one of them fails, the, the other is the safety net into which one falls. Uh, so I, I hope that's clear, but we will, we will get the lawyers to, to spell it out uh, properly. In terms of legislative vehicles, I, th I think the Cabinet Secretary, when previously asked about this, the phrase he's used is that we're, looking, we're exploring all, uh, all available options. Uh, he's explained that we're still trying to work constructively with DEFRA, and uh, I think the, certainly I've heard the Secretary of State say to the Cabinet Secretary in private meetings, and I think he said it in public as well, that uh, uh, taking powers through this agriculture bill is still an option that would be on the table, albeit that the Cabinet Secretary has uh, described some very big obstacles to that. But of course, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, uh, we are perfectly capable of legislating through the Scottish Parliament, and so that would be an alternative, uh, and uh, all options are being uh, kept open and, and explored. OK, so Cabinet Secretary, then, can I ask you directly, is there going to be a Scottish agricultural bill? Well, we continue to work with the UK government on the UK Ag, Ag Bill. I've made that clear already, I think, twice. If that doesn't happen and we require to take our own measures, obviously we are free to do so. And there is ample time within which to do so under every scenario. So there is no problem, there is no issue. And uh, our legal advice will demonstrate that beyond doubt. Before you go on, I think Mike wants to come in and then I'll, I'll come back to you. Mike. Thanks very much, Convener. I just wanted to make 
that I haven't misunderstood David Barnes's response to the question that Jamie Green asked. So you said, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I just want to make it clear, we didn't need the continuity bill to make these payments. So all that hassle that we went through for the continuity bill, I voted against it, by the way, um, it wasn't necessary. Is that what you're saying? Con convener, I, I, I hope I did. I believe I chose my words very carefully, and I said that for this single very precise point, in the absence of the continuity bill, there is effectively a safety net. Uh, so I was confining those comments to this one very specific point about continuation of CAP payments. So I'm, I'm not competent to make a, uh, a comment on the okay. wider need for the continuity bill. Um, sorry, can I just clarify, and, and, and I apologise if I'm taking anyone other's, other's point here, is Cabinet Secretary, what, what you're saying is, is, is there will be a Scottish agricultural bill if we need it. If we don't need it and, we, and you can work with the UK, then you'll work with the UK. Is that right? Um, if, if we need to act by way of legislation, then of course we would consider so doing. And if it proves to be necessary, I, I imagine, and this is for Cabinet to decide that that's exactly what would happen. Obviously, a, a, that's, I mean, that's a statement of the obvious. Uh, and uh, that's the course we propose to, to take should that scenario arise. But, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the UK government will start to justify the decisions that it's reached uh, rather than simply assert them. OK, I'll come back to Jeremy, sir. In yesterday's uh, session in Westminster, uh, uh, the NFUS uh, made the following statement, and I wonder if you could comment on it. Uh, the continu continuity issues are reasonably clear, uh, but if uh, we wanted to move to a new support settlement beyond the cap, we would have to have a legal framework to do so. Scottish ministers will have to have the power from somewhere, either through this bill, presumably they mean the UK Agricultural Bill, through a schedule, which the Scottish Government does not want to participate in, or through a Scottish bill in the Scottish Parliament. But at the moment, we have no clarity or certainty or on what that might be or when that might come forward. From your answer today, can we assume that there's uh, ongoing uh, lack of clarity and certainty then, given that you've no lack of no, any given lack no commitment of clarity to today. On, on our part. We've had a number of discussions with the NFU about this matter, and we will continue so to do. We are absolutely clear that for the reasons that myself and Mr Barnes have set out, there is no problem that we will provide for all eventualities in, in any way necessary. It will not be particularly complicated or difficult so to do. No further questions. OK, so just, just in clarity, I mean, we've got a quote here that Pete Wishart said uh, that, of course, there'll be a Scottish Government bill uh, relating to agriculture. It, was he a bit early in making that comment? If, there's necessary, if, we, if it's necessary for us to have a bill, then we will have a bill. Okay. Uh, there's no problem about that. There's plenty of time to do it. And moreover, the bill wouldn't be particularly complicated, as I understand it. It would be very straightforward, and it would be limited to what is necessary in order to achieve the Colin. specific point of being able to amend CAP. There's nothing difficult or complex about this. And really, you know, my view, convener, is instead of arguing over, um, it almost seems to be dancing in the head of a pin, a sort of medieval metaphysical argument born of a desire to nitpick and troublemake. And would it not be better that we actually talk about things that matter to farmers and crofters, because there's no shortage of those. Right, we're going to move on to the next question, so, which sorry, is... Sorry, Eleanor Mitchell maybe wanted to... I, head of Ag wanted well, to, sorry, to come in just secretary, briefly. Sorry, I, I didn't catch... Uh, I, I My think apologies, I didn't hear... I didn't know that until just okay. a moment ago that she wanted to... It, very briefly, Eleanor, I'm happy to bring I you in. I just wondered if it was helpful. So, in my head, um, just for the avoidance of doubt, there's three clear periods we're working to. So, there's a period... Um, post-Brexit, Brexit Day until 2021, and we're very clear that we have the legal arrangements in place uh, under either scenario, using either continuity or the withdrawal bill to be able to use current cap regulations, so that is very clear. The stability and simplicity uh, consultation document tells us the story of what's going to happen between 2021 and 2024 or 25, which is that we're going to use, um, uh, we're going to try out some new different things. We're going to test out perhaps different ways of um, um, model farming or other or other things we could do to try out some way, some new um, ways of 
offering payments to farmers and others. And during that period of time, we're going to take the, the time we need to develop a clear future policy for payments for farmers and crofters, along with the wider information we've been, we've been given under the NCRA report and others. So there are, there are, very, there are three very clear uh, timeframes, and I think we've got clear um, plans for each of them to take forward the work we need to do. Okay. And, and now we are going to move on to the next question, which is Colin. Thanks very much, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, back in 2016, you said we're going to consult on a Good Food Nations Bill, and you hope to build cross-party and stakeholder consensus. Um, and obviously, that bill was a manifesto commitment. Now, that, that consensus appeared to break down um, when the programme of government um, apparently diminished that, that commitment to a standalone Good Food Nations Bill. Now, obviously, Parliament in September voted very clearly in support of a standalone Good Food Nations Bill. So can I ask, are you going to deliver on the will of Parliament? And will you legislate for a standalone Good Food Nations Bill, including the right to food? Well, there's, there's several questions there. The specific right to food is, is, is a, um, a very important one and a very detailed one. We have made a very clear commitment to consult on proposed legislative solutions. and to do so this year, before the end of the year, and that's, that uh, the document is in the course of preparation, convener, and therefore I, I very much hope that once that is available, then we can have a proper, thorough, considered, rational discussion about the legislative options about this. And therefore I think that that will introduce um, a, a, an element to the discussion which will be very useful. I think Eleanor Mitchell might be able to add to that. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the document has a, sets out a range of measures and as the Cabinet Secretary said, there are plans in place to um, consult on those measures um, and, if, if, and, and if there are elements of that which folks don't feel that they, are, they're, they're, they fully covered all the things we would need to do in order to, be, to progress um, food, Good Food Nation, then well, of course, we'll take them on board as, they, as we hear as a consultation proceeds. Okay. I'm not clear what's being proposed. I mean, you previously said there would be a standalone Good Food Nations Bill. Um, in the programme of government, you said there would be a wider piece of legislation, most likely a farm and, and food bill. What exactly is it? And you know, just to be clear, will you be aiming to legislate for the right to food? Will you be legislating for uh, an independent statutory body to oversee the implementation of um, the Good Food Nations um, programme, and will there be statutory targets? I mean, are these the things that you are specifically proposing to legislate for, and what will actually that that legislation look like? Will it be a Good Food Nations Bill, which Parliament said it should be, or will it be this Farmer and Food Bill, which the programme of government seem to be suggesting it will be? Well, you know, there's a whole range of questions there, convener, and I just don't think I've got the time to answer all of them. I think in practice what we're doing them, to consult with the public and all interested parties is the routine, orthodox, correct approach so that these matters can be considered not in a polemic way, not in a political way, but in a rational and considered way. And therefore our consultation, and, and uh, uh, you know, I've, I've undertaken it, will be issued this year despite all the Brexit workload which is, uh, which is thrust upon us, in addition to the normal workload, we will carry on with the day job, we will issue the consultation. Uh, and it would be quite improper, really for me, I think, to prejudge the views of the people of Scotland and all the stakeholders. And for me, blithely to say, to give uh, yes or no answers to all these important questions, the whole point of a consultation is to consider things properly, thoroughly, rationally, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Colin, do you, want, do you want to follow that up? I, I just, it, it seems strange that we've had a manifesto for a Good Food Nations Bill, but we're not sure anymore. We had a programme of government um, very recently that specifically said there would most likely be a farm, farm and food bill, but what we're now being told is we don't really know yet. Well, I don't agree with that characterisation. And, and with respect, convener, you know, I think most people out there are thinking, let's get this Brexit business sorted out. Let our politicians devote their attentions to what is absolutely essential and needs to be done. That's what I'm doing. I think, with respect, Cabinet Secretary, what the consensus is from all the stakeholders is that we need a Good Food Nations Bill to tackle the scandal of things like food poverty uh, 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 in Scotland today, and that's important to the people. But 
we'll, we'll wait and see the consultation. Well, there are I, many, I, many as, different sorry, views. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I, I, as convener, I think you've had a chance to make a statement, and so has Colin, and, <laughs> and I don't want to give either of you the last word, so I'm going to move on to the next question, which is Stuart Stevenson. Uh, on Thursday last week, the UK Government published a fisheries bill. What engagement has the Scottish Government had with the preparation of that bill? Okay. Um, well, at the, the meetings that I've referred to between the UK Government and the devolved administrations, um, I've had a, a, a fairly detailed discussions uh, about fishing, not as detailed as ag, agriculture. The Fisheries Bill has recently been published. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that you know, our officials have played a, um, a, a very constructive and positive role uh, in that. Um, uh, and we uh, are able to say that through the efforts of our officials, original proposals which were going to provide that, uh, for example, all matters relating to, or most matters relating to quota would be set by the UK government, that after discussion and sensible dialogue, that particular provision was altered uh, in a way that it would not interfere with devolved powers. So I'm actually uh, pleased that the dialogue has had some um, positive outcomes. Um, so we have sought to work constructively with DEFRA and the other devolved administrations in order to advance our fishing interests. There's more work to be done. There are matters which are, we will still need to look at carefully. We've only just got the bill. We didn't get advance notice of it uh, 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 in, in its in its substance. So uh, I hope that we can perhaps come back to this convener once we're a little bit further down the road. Joe. Sure. <laughs> okay. We'll move on to the next question then, which will be from Richard Lyle. Richard. Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, it's my understanding that in September 20, uh, 2018, the UK Government and the Welsh Government published a joint statement on agricultural framework progress. Why was it? that the Scottish Government was not included in that joint statement? Um, yep. which, uh, which statement are you referring to? September 2018, the government, Welsh Government published a joint statement on agricultural framework progress. Oh, yes. We were not uh, sure. included in that joint statement. Well, we. we I mean, we, we have taken part in the processes agreed centrally between the Scottish Government and the UK Government to discuss frameworks in an exploratory um, way. Um, and uh, we've sought, therefore, to be positive about that. And we've taken part in these discussions, again, without prejudice to the overall positions on Bre Brexit, where we differ substantially from, um, from the UK. However, the UK Government approach for example, to the Ag Bill, in attempting to assert a UK-wide framework has been, we believe, unhelpful. Uh, and despite that, we're continuing to work with the UK Government to seek to resolve uh, the matters. The joint statement is a matter for the administrations that signed it. Um, Welsh ministers have already, and I think this is a, a fair point to make, convener, made it clear that they are in a different position given the different result of the EU referendum in Wales from Scotland. Richard. Okay. Um, do you agree that the vast majority of policy areas can be managed through non-legislative intergovernmental coordination? And do you also agree that if the UK government would work with the Scottish government and not against the Scottish government, it would be good? Um, well, obviously, we we would like to uh, the UK government to respect devolution and not to impose matters upon us um, in the way that, sadly. Uh, is being done in the agricultural bill, uh, and uh, despite that, and despite, if you like, taking the blows, um, we are still engaging positively in the hope that common sense can ultimately prevail. And lastly, the joint UK and Welsh Government statement on agricultural framework progress says, an administrative frame, and I quote, an administrative framework will be developed. It will ensure that there is coordination dialogue between the administrations on how any changes to legislation in one part of the UK may affect other parts. Will this, the Scottish Government be part of this administrative framework? 
well, engagement has been taking place and, and does so on a daily basis. So that, that engagement between officials um, will continue. And myself, Ms Cunningham, Mr Day, Mr, Mr. Russell leading will continue to, um, a, to engage in the various forums and meetings where these matters are discussed and doing so. You know, I think the public wants us to try to be reasonable where we can and try to set aside our differences where we can in, this, in the hope that solutions can be found. But I think also the public in Scotland expect us to stand up for this institution and stand up for Scotland and stand up for the powers of this Scottish Parliament. Uh, and therefore, that is our approach. Do you sometimes get frustrated with this process? Um, <laughs> Sir Cabinet Secretary, <laughs> in, 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 in a different place when, uh, when, when we have more time. Uh, and, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to answer you. Jamie, you have a follow-up <laughs> question, and, and then I want to move on to the next one. Jamie. Thank, thank you, Convener. I appreciate there's a, there's a fair amount of, of politics in all of this, but can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, from a civil service point of view, and I think this is an important point, could he, he or anyone in the panel update us on the important 24 areas of uh, common frameworks uh, that have been... Uh, as we understand, going into deep dive uh, over the last months and weeks, what progress has been made to ensure that there is a, a, a sensible, coordinated approach to UK frameworks? Well, I'm very pleased to say that the man in the deep dive from the diving board to the swimming pool is to my right here, so I think I'll let David speak about the deep dives. Briefly, if I may, encourage you to be brief. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, I was I've been involved in the deep dive uh, in one particular policy area, lots of other Scottish Government officials are involved across the other areas. This is a process that is under a mandate set collectively by the JMCEN, the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, uh, which had a progress report relatively recently. Uh, the Agriculture uh, and Environment Ministers uh, meet again in November and will, uh, I expect, probably have this on their agenda as well. Uh, is progress, are discussions happening and progress being made? Yes. Are agreements imminent? I think the answer is no. Um, my colleagues in our central constitutional area are in the absolute lead on the process. My understanding is that there are a number of other Brexit-related global non-agricultural issues that need to fall into place before uh, any agreement could be finalised. So progress, yes. Imminent agreement, uh, not yet. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, and the next question is from Peter Chapman. Peter. Um, thank you, Convener. In, in October this year, Mr Gove announced a review to deliver fair funding for farmers in all four parts of the UK when we leave the EU. What input have you had to the process of setting up the fair funding review? <laughs> well, uh, I can... Just, yeah, you just, just before you go to that, I, I, I know you may want to look back. I think Mr Chapman is trying to encourage you to look forward, and, and, and I look Answer forward to your answer. I mean, I think it's very important to say that uh, this began a long before October. Mr Gove announced last November, not, not uh, a, you know, this month, but nearly a year ago, that there would be a review. We agreed in principle in February of this year the terms of reference. Mr Davidson was on the call at which the agreement took place. Um, and then, in August, unilaterally and without warning, the terms of reference were completely changed and diluted by the Treasury. Um, and moreover, uh, the UK uh, changed um, various of its agreed uh, components of the review. Um, uh, so uh, the announcement that was made by Mr Gove was made without reference to us. It was made without agreeing the terms of the review without that agreement being finalised. Uh, and Mr Gove has acknowledged that in correspondence and apologised for that. So, uh, where are we going here, Convener? Well, we want this review to go ahead because I think it's necessary to undo a manifest injustice where money clearly intended uh, and really only intended for Scottish farmers and crofters was diverted by the UK government for other purposes. Um, we made it clear that we do not expect any payments to be recouped from farmers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but we do expect justice. Lord Bew has been suggested by Mr Gove uh, as the person to conduct this review. We agree with that suggestion. Uh, he's a crossbencher, a uh, man of, of uh, 
of repute, uh, 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 and we have faith in that. We will nominate our representative, as agreed with Mr Gove, um, in the course of the discussions from November to the spring of, of uh, this year. Um, but it's deeply dispiriting that after we reached agreement with the UK Government, they then moved the goalposts uh, in a way that seeks to dilute the review so that so watered down that it no longer really reflects the requirements. But be all that as it may, I understand that the inquiry will be an independent inquiry. It will be free to come to its own conclusions and recommendations. It will have input from a representative of uh, a, a reputable representative, an experienced representative from Scotland uh, and Wales and Northern Ireland. And I believe that, that the advice it gives, and I hope that it will conclude in a matter of months, uh, will be a very useful method of informing the debate that we then need to have about the intra-UK allocation of funding, um, both uh, pre- and post-Brexit. I mean, this is a very important process, and I, re I recognise that it's it, it is exactly that. And you know, there is, you, you recognise that the, the convergence funding has, has been spent, but it doesn't mean to say that this the review can't take that into account. And I would hope it does take that into account going forward. And that, that is my that has always been my position in the last 18 months or so that the money is that has been spent, so we're not going to get that back, but we can look forward and think that it's, it should be part of this process, and I would, I would expect that to be the case. So, you know, I, I think this is something that we can uh, welcome, and, I, and I, you know, I would look forward to how it, how it pans out. But we must, of course, avoid at all costs that this money is part of the Barnett formula, because that would be a disaster for Scottish agriculture. Um, Disagree. <laughs> well, there's various part. I mean, I agree with with some of it. I'm pleased that he's, that Mr. Chapman is supportive of the review. I do think that it was always agreed that there would be a review since Owen Paterson, and that it was agreed the review looked not just post Brexit. I mean, that wasn't envisaged at the time of the agreement of the review. It was agreed that we'd look at what actually happened, and uh, that still must happen. Uh, there is an opportunity to undo a manifest injustice, and that's an issue not not affecting Wales and Northern Ireland, but affecting Scotland and the UK Government. So I hope that it will do that. Um, the stakeholders have supported us in review, and also they have criticised the UK Government for its moving of the goalposts. And the last point I make, uh, Convener, is this, that, that um, the whole point of convergence policy by the EU was to make farm payments fair across the EU. It was to bring up by one third the level of the lowest to 90% of, of the EU average. Now, I have some figures here that indicate that, uh, um, that the average payment per hectare uh, in the period from 2014 to 2020 for rural development funding per hectare uh, ranges from Malta 1,236 euros, the EU average 76 euros, to Scotland. 12 euros. Now, this table here, which I'm happy to share with the committee, shows that next year the rate of receipt of farm support on the hectareage basis, the EU basis of whole payments, will be 12 euros. Uh, the EU average will be 76 euros. We will receive the lowest of every single EU state and a r less than half of that pertaining in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So, I just mention these because we will need to debate this long and hard, but on the face of it, Scottish farmers and crofters get a raw deal, they've had a raw deal, the UK Government have perpetrated that raw deal, and my determination is to stand up for Scottish farmers and crofters and redress that injustice to them, both in the past and in the future. I'm going to move on to the next question, which is Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Um, you'll be aware uh, you gave evidence yesterday to the Scottish Affairs Committee inquiry entitled The Future of Scottish Agriculture Post-Brexit. Um, clearly, there's an opportunity here to uh, look at uh, subsidy systems. There may be some divergence uh, in terms of policy from two governments on where they want to take that uh, in terms of direction. Uh, what, are, what is your commentary to Johnny Hall's evidence yesterday that said that uh, CAP has not done Scottish agriculture any great favours. It's created a culture of uh, dependency, uh, incentivised inertia, 
stifled innovation, prevented new entrants and done little or no for the environment. Do you agree with those comments? Um, no, I don't. Um, I, I, I agree with, with the NFU that, and the agricultural champions, incidentally, that we should encourage more pro productivity and more professional mindset. Um, I agree with, uh, with NGOs who believe that we, we should work together in order to encourage more environmental practice where it can practically be done and sensibly be done. And myself and Ms Cunningham are doing a lot of work on that at, at the moment, as is right and proper. Um, but I think that characterisation of the CAP in that way is, is really just too negative. Um, also, I mean, the EU has been a good friend to hill farmers. Let's, let's face it, it has provided a certainty and stability in funding. Um, it's also enabled a large number of environmental schemes to operate in Scotland and created a lot of good work as a result to alleviate flooding, to deal with, uh, uh, with uh, various environmental issues that was right and proper to do so. So, you know, I, I'm not sure that, that, uh, that you know, that, that the individual is entitled to his views, but um, I don't agree with them. Okay, so the purpose of that inquiry, and I suspect uh, uh, the purpose of um, the, the, the Scottish Government's own work, is to look at the future uh, post-CAP. Uh, what are your views on the work of Westminster's Scottish Affairs Committee on this? I know you participated via evidence, but are you, is the Scottish Government uh, having any formal role uh, in that inquiry? And indeed, how is the uh, Scottish Government uh, working uh, with Westminster or indeed the UK government to look at any common areas of interest in a post-CAP scenario? Um, well, I mean, I'm happy the Scottish Affairs Committee is taking an interest in the future of Scottish agriculture. My formal role, I think, was uh, very much evident yesterday when I gave evidence for an hour uh, to them together with officials. Um, uh, I'm keen to continue to engage with the UK government about uh, um, the future of agriculture in Britain. And, and as I've said, I, I very much hope that the UK government will reconsider its abandonment of a commitment to um, provision of financial support, continued financial support for food production in the UK. I think it's a fundamental issue at stake here. Uh, and if, if it's not right in the agricultural bill to debate it, when is? So in all these respects, yes, I welcome the committee's work. And yes, we will continue to engage with the government. Uh, although sometimes, uh, in a state of somewhat frustration, it's more in hope than expectation. Cabinet Secretary, uh, I, I too welcome everyone looking at, at, at the future of uh, agriculture in Scotland. Um, I'm just wondering how a Westminster committee are going to feed in uh, on a devolved matter to a committee in the Scottish Parliament. And perhaps you could say how, how you see that happening and whether you welcome that, that feed in and how you're going to make it work properly as far as the government's concerned? Well, I think the relationship between the two committees is not for really for me, it's for you. Um, you know, obviously we, well, unless I'm missing something, I mean, I think I, it's not for me to, to, to issue instructions or advice to, to Parliament with respect. I think it's for Parliament to decide, but I think it's, it's right and proper that there's a courteous, a courteous positive engagement. Uh, and, you know, I took part yesterday in their proceedings and I rearranged my day so to do because I attach importance to making myself accountable to Scotland's MPs uh, who have decided quite fairly to inquire into something of great importance. You know, and I hope the points I'm making about food production are making a bit of an impact here. There's a real debate here that needs to be had. Um, yes, the environment's absolutely fundamental. It's important that we continue to support it, but not that we just abandon the support for farming. That seems to me to be an extraordinary proposition, and yet that's virtually the proposition that the UK government is uh, proposing. And I did ask yesterday whether any of the MPs uh, involved, um, some from your own party, would be happy about the prospect of their constituents ceasing to receive the financial support which is necessary for the functioning uh, and continuance of their business. Uh, but I didn't catch any answer to that particular question, but perhaps uh, my job was to answer the questions there on that occasion. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The next question is from Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, as you'll be aware, the National Council of Rural Advisors published their final report last month. Will you be implementing the recommendations? Um, yes, well, I, I welcome the re report. Uh, we are studying this in, in detail. It, it describes why rural matters, what rural thinks, what rural needs. 
what happens next. It's, it has a suggested set of actions. It worked very hard going around the, the country holding 11 events and it had a consultation with 130 uh, responses. Um, it uh, makes a series of recommendations. We're looking at these at the moment, but broadly speaking, we're very happy with the recommendations and we think that they're well worthy of this committee uh, looking carefully at them with a view to taking forward, uh, uh, with a view to uh, considering the recommendations further and our taking uh, them, uh, them forward. I'm particularly keen uh, to um, continue the focus on the rural economy and have a rural economy action group to guide the work that needs to happen during the transition uh, towards mainstreaming the rural economy. And uh, I commend the report to members. Um, just to follow up on the action group, will you inform the committee once you know what the membership of the group will be? Um, of course, we, in respect of all uh, these matters, will seek to continue to keep the committee um, advised. Thanks. Thank you. Um, John, I think yours is the next question. Yes, thanks very much, convener, uh, again. Um, as I understand it, the new farmers entrance scheme uh, it was announced uh, during August that it would close at the end of August, which seemed a uh, quite short notice, but I understand that may have been because the funds had all been used up. Uh, can you tell us going forward how we would encourage new and I suppose especially younger farmers to move into uh, farming? I have to say we had somebody last night at one of the receptions in Parliament, a younger woman, who was, came across very impressively, and uh, I wonder how you see that going forward. Okay, um, well, we, we have um, provided a total of 22.4 million of grant commitments in respect of new entrant schemes, um, and the number of, of people assisted under the startup and capital grant schemes total 1,138, um, and the new entrant scheme uh, is now exhausted, as the member has said, but and the funds were used up, so you know the, the, the scheme was fully utilised, but not before kick-starting over 250 new agricultural businesses and funding hundreds of other business development projects. Um, we are also working with the phone group um, um, farm, Farming Opportunities uh, uh, in other ways, uh, and Henry Graham is, is looking at that. Um, They've helped provide over 60 more land opportunities across mainly the National Forest Estate, but also land owned by Scottish Water, HIE and Highland and East Lothian Council. And they're currently beginning the, the process to identify further opportunities in 2019. And I was very pleased that, um, that uh, this scheme was recognised by European um, research body as an inspiration. Um, so it was with some regret that we were not able to, to continue the funding that was exhausted in respect of this. The last thing I would say is that we do envisage, and, and I hope that across the, all the parties support exists for this, uh, that one of the things that we would wish to try out in our stability simplicity approach is uh, to, to identify um, you know, a, a wider way in order to support new entrants and uh, particularly younger people into farming. There are many different ways, not only financial, but through the provision of advice and mentoring and matching, for example, that this can be done. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, I, uh, uh, and I should say, it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy to provide support and then guarantee that someone will make a success of a business. I mean, plainly, one needs to have a motivated, determined, impressive, hardworking uh, man or woman or couple uh, to take that forward. Um, so these are not easy things to, to be efficacious. And I don't think actually uh, just signing a cheque is necessarily the be-all and end-all to this respect, but plainly it's an important facet. So I hope that there's a commitment across the board, convener, that we will come back to look at what might be a new substantial policy for new entrants in Scotland. If I can just uh, follow up then. Um, I mean, clearly we're looking at the whole picture of support for farming going forward. So. It's possible that uh, attracting new people into farming would be part of the bigger new overall package, or we might have a separate package for new farmers, but that's too early to decide on that yet, is it? Well, I, th I think this is an option for future policy post-Brexit or not post-Brexit, actually. I mean, in either event, I think it's something we need to, uh, we need to come back to, and I, and I, hope, that, uh, I hope that we will. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Um, and the last lot of questions are from Richard Lahm. Yes, Cabinet Secretary, I can return to the subject of small land holdings. Small land holdings are tenanted holdings under the Small Land Holding Act 1886 1931, typically farming 50 acres or less. And I'll uh, combine the two questions that I have. Um, what insights have recent research and publications on small land holdings provided? Do they indicate that particular action is required? And do you intend to ask the Scottish Land Commission to review the law on small land holdings and to recommend reforms? Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, I, I think uh, you indicated you wanted to ask if the Scottish Law Commission, not Land Commission. Uh, did, did I get that Sorry, law, no, if I said Land Commission, I do apologise. Law Commission. Thank you. Sorry. sorry. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Cabinet we did commission Sir Crispin Agnew to write a guide to small land holding legislation, which was published on the 25th of September. We haven't had any feedback on it yet, but there has been interest from some small landowners who have been in touch with us for a copy. Um, a, in addition to that, we appointed Newcastle University to consider the changes to ownership of small land holdings over time and the feasibility of establishing an administrative register of all small land holdings. And this work is completed and it will be published shortly for those with an interest in this area. Um, and they concluded that it would be possible to re-establish a register of small land holders. Um, the cost is estimated at 130,000. There are only 68 small land, hold land holders. Um, in response to the question about the Scottish Law Commission that uh, Mr Lyle asked, um, the 17 review showed strong evidence that small landowners, their landlords and in some cases legal practitioners have not understood the legislation that governs, governs them and this lack of understanding may have contributed in the past to disputes and rises of practices that are out of step with legislation. And that's why I commissioned the guide uh, from Sir Crispin that makes legislation more accessible. So, you know, I think the guide has just been published. We haven't had a great deal of reaction to that. I think it would be premature to consider the question of uh, whether a reference to the Scottish Law Commission is appropriate, uh, having just published the guide, which I think Parliament had sought, it, sought that we do in order to bring some clarity to the legislation. So I think we should look at that first, digest that, and then decide whether or not we need to do anything else. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I can confirm Sir Crispin Agnew's uh, 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 briefing is extremely useful and actually quite easy to understand. So uh, thank you for that. I think, Cabinet Secretary, that brings us to the end of the questions that, that we've got. I'd like to thank you, um, Eleanor and David, for, for your contributions. Ian and Douglas were, were, were supporting, I think, from the side, but uh, were, were, were excused. No, Ian, you did say something as well, so I apologise. So, Douglas, you sat on the sidelines, but thank you all for the evidence that you've given, and I'd now like to uh, close the meeting. Thank you.